Hey, my friends, this is Pastor Jerry Cannon. I want to thank you so much for joining us today for our worship service. You are in for a treat. That's right. As we start Lent, we have a special guest in the person of Reverend Fred Lyons, the interim pastor at Providence Presbyterian Church. We did a pulpit exchange and I was at Providence and he was here at C.N. Jenkins. If you haven't already subscribed, I want you to do that. But in the meantime, get your Bibles, get your pen and paper and get ready for a word. We love you. Enjoy this worship. I'd like us to think about the title, In This and That with Jesus. In the This and That of Jesus. Once more, once more we enter these 40 days of Lent, the season of preparation for Easter that so often seems to hinge on what we give up. Once more we enter Lent, taking a journey that so often seems to be associated with guilt trips. Once more we brace ourselves for the way Lent so often seems to scream a spirituality of grim determination. Giving up, guilt trips, grim determination. I want to go in a different direction. Several years ago, a young girl of seven or eight years old was new to our church and our summer vacation Bible school. She was quite the character and not at all shy about speaking up. Two stories about her are particularly memorable. Towards the end of the week, this little girl could be heard talking to one of her friends, complaining the following, it's Jesus this and Jesus that. All they ever talk about around here is Jesus. <laughs> oh man, right? <laughs> Wish that that were more the case, right? <laughs> the other is that we got a report back from one of her teachers that when the teacher said, talked about how amazing Jesus was, this little girl said, Talk about amazing. Look at these new shoes my mother got me. So, so what in the world does that have to do with Lent? I'll tell you. I want to celebrate a Lenten season. Yes, celebrate. Celebrate a Lenten season during which we prepare for Easter by way of being disciples who are developing a laser-sharp focus, not only on talking about Jesus, but also following where and when Jesus is operating, where and when Jesus is operating in the this and that of our lives. And by the this and that of our lives, I, I have in mind a heightened awareness, a heightened awareness of Jesus in all the aspects of our lives. Then if I may be so bold, along with celebrating a heightened awareness of Jesus in the this and that of our lives, I want to celebrate a Lenten season that is amazing. Have you ever had an amazing Lenten season? If, if you have, share it with others. And if you haven't, let's get ready to do something amazing, right? I believe that we will be more likely to have a heightened awareness of Jesus and then this and that of our lives during Lent, that we will more likely experience an amazing Lent when we spend less en energy on giving up and more energy on girding up. When we spend less energy on guilt trips and more energy on gratitude trips, we spend less energy on grim determination and more energy on glad discipleship. Let's spend less. Let's spend less energy giving up and more energy girding up. Certainly people are to be comm commended and should be rewarded when they reach the point in their lives when they give up habits that bring harm to themselves and others. We celebrate that, but too often when people give up during Lent, it is more symbolic than substantive. I'm giving up cookies for Lent. Well, good for you. How's that changing the world? How's that deepening your faith? You go ahead and keep those cookies up on the shelf and don't worry about it. No, we need to do something a little bit more substantive than that. I believe we would be better off pursuing ways to gird up, not give up. 
girt up by first seeking the power of the Holy Spirit, the true source of what girds us up with the wherewithal to more fully participate in what God has in store for us and God's sacred purposes, to gird up our will to withstand forces that would weaken our commitment to the repentance of turning away from sin in order to move towards that which is sacred. Gird up by following the example of Jesus, the example of Jesus in what we think, say, and do, the example of Jesus in the way the faith, hope, and love shape our lives and the way that we behave, the example of Jesus in how we prioritize what matters most in the this and the that of our lives. Let's spend less. Let's spend less energy on guilt trips and more energy on gratitude trips. You know, they say that guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. Some of you know that for more than others, right? Maybe guilt trips have their part, maybe guilt trips have been a part of your own faith journey and have experienced that. Or perhaps you've seen the impact of guilt trips on others. And certainly it is important to take healthy personal accountability for our foibles, our mistakes, our outright sins. We need to be held accountable for that. But a witness to Christ that prescribes a steady dose of guilt trips can never be anything but debilitating. Maybe you know of a situation like this. This is a real life situation. A young woman in her 30s was getting ready to join the church that Jan and I were serving. And as good Presbyterians, we know that if you're going to join a church, one of the many things that you need to do is what? Be baptized. Okay? Well, when that subject came up, this young woman looked very startled and was almost on the verge of tears. She had never been baptized. Okay, that's fine, but we found a deeper story behind not being baptized. After the class was over, Jan took her aside and talked with her and found out that she grew up in a family where every time she told her mother she was ready to be baptized, her mother says, you think you're good enough to be baptized? Think about that, to have that trope over and over again. You think you're good enough to be baptized? The mother must have forgotten that the old hymn is not harshly and angrily Jesus is calling. It's softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Not, oh sinner, leave the house. Come home, come home. This is the sort of attitude that reminds me of people who say, Jesus loves you even though you're a worthless sinner. I think it should be the other way around. Even though you're a worthless sinner, Jesus loves you. The last word is what? Jesus loves you, not that you're a sinner. Jesus loves you. And Jesus is dying to let us know that the most reliable response to the amazing grace of God in Christ is to be grateful. Grateful in ways that we not only give our thanks, but also live our thanks. Grateful in ways that gratitude is the attitude with which we not only receive grace, but also extend grace to others, family, friends, strangers, even enemies. I'm not your enemy, but I am a, I'm strange to you right now, but I'm feeling, feeling quite at home, so thank you. So this Len, get on the grateful train. Get on the grateful train and take a gratitude trip. Let's spend less energy. Let's spend less energy on grim determination and more energy on glad discipleship. Yeah. Certainly determination can be a virtue in the process of setting and reaching goals of having a purpose in life and having some meaning to your life, but grim determination can be so exhausting and not in a good way. Too many Calvinist Presbyterians have a reputation for being a grimly determined, purse lip frozen chosen lot, and I can assure you that does not describe this congregation. <laughs> we need to take, bottle you up and take you around to some of these folks who need to, need to, need to lighten up. <laughs> oh my gosh. 
I believe that Jesus calls us to a glad discipleship, a glad discipleship rooted in a heightened awareness of Jesus in the this and that of our lives, a glad discipleship rooted in being girded up, of being filled with gratitude, all of which I believe can make for an amazing Lent. And why, after all, think about it, why would Jesus not call us to a glad discipleship? Why would he not? As the Gospel of Mark tells us, Jesus opens his public ministry by proclaiming good news. In the, in the King James Version, it's glad tidings. Glad tidings. Glad tidings of God. Glad tidings whose time is fulfilled like a glass is filled full. Filled full to the very brim. So full that if you put one more drop of water, the whole thing would spill over. It's ready to burst open upon us. Glad tidings of the reign of God being so very close that you'll smack right into it the instant you turn around. It's so close that it's if you take the elbow and the hand, as the hand reaches you at hand, we're already connecting with the elbow. That's how close the reign of God is all the time. Glad tidings, what? Worth believing. Believe the glad tidings. Believe the good news. Repent. Believe in the good news of the gospel. This morning's lesson from Mark signals that girding up, gratitude trips, and glad discipleship are grounded in Jesus, grounded in Jesus being a Savior whose sovereignty is demonstrated by being in solidarity with us, being in solidarity with us when things go sideways, when things go wrong, when things just get out of control. Jesus does not need a sinner's baptism, but he chooses to share in the experience of being baptized, right down to the vulnerability of the whole exercise, the vulnerability of being fully plunged into the waters of the Jordan, no sprinkling, fully into the immersion, into the Jordan, and trusting that John the Baptist will pull him up safely. It's that vulnerability of when you're first coming out of the water, you gasp for air. Jesus has experienced that by going through baptism. When it says he came out of the water, they're not talking about walking up onto the shore. They're talking about being underwater and being pulled up. That's Jesus coming out of the water, and he knows what it's like to need someone to pull him back up. He knows what it's like to grasp for air and to need that special, precious air that comes from the Holy Spirit to get us through. He knows that even if for but a moment, even for just a second, Jesus knows more than merely metaphorically what it feels like to be rescued, and even more so the need to be rescued. This solidarity is underscored by the 40 days that Jesus spends in the wilderness. Listen to Frederick Beekner's take on the importance of this wilderness time that Jesus goes through. He writes, we will come to love God at last as from the first God has loved us, loved us even in the wilderness, especially in the wilderness because God has been in the wilderness with us, end quote. When we are in wilderness times of our own, Jesus is closer than we realize. All the more reason to develop a heightened awareness of Jesus in the this and that of our lives. All the more reason to celebrate amazing grace throughout our Lenten journey, our Lenten journey to the empty tomb, to the resurrection, repentance on the way to resurrection. This closeness, this closeness is at the heart of the good news, the glad tidings of the reign of God. It has come near. It is at hand. It is now. It is so very much happening that Jesus urges us to repent and believe the glad tidings of it, to turn around and take hold of the reign of God, not as if our lives depend on it, but because our lives depend on it. There's no if about it. In her commentary on today's lesson from Mark, Denise Anderson, do you know Denise Anderson, know of Denise Anderson? She's a good friend of the Cannon family, by the way. 
Denise Anderson was co-moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA from 2016 through 2018. Uh, she's brilliant. Uh, and my wife, Jan Edmondson, got a chance to be co-moderators co co with her during that time. Last year, Denise published a, some commentary uh, on Mark, including this particular passage. And she writes this, but to describe the closeness of Jesus to us. Quote, in pivotal moments, God is extraordinarily present with Jesus and those around him, and for good reason. In the black church, we sing of how God picks us up, turns us around, and places our feet where? On solid ground. God's proximity informs our trajectory. God approaches us to claim, equip, and send us to do God's will. Again and again, God meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us there. And that's the money quote this morning. That's the money quote right there. Again and again, God meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us there. And then she continues, we shift from sinking sand to solid ground, from navel gazing to community, from personal pietism to justice for all, and away from behaviors both personal and systemic that frustrate God's vision for the world, end quote. And so, as once more we journey through these 40 days of preparation for Easter, preparation for the empty tomb of repentance on the way to resurrection, may we dare to celebrate an amazing Lent, an amazing Lent wherein we heighten our awareness of Jesus in this, in the this and that of our lives, an amazing Lent wherein we gird up, an amazing Lent wherein we book passage on a gratitude trip, an amazing Lent wherein we embrace glad discipleship that is sustained by a Savior who remains in solidarity with us, a holy Redeemer who is as close as the beating of our hearts. One final thought. I promise, because when preachers say that, you know, <laughs> you know you're in for a five amen sermon, right? But this really is one final thought. You know, wilderness is often associated with the desert, with deserted places. But wilderness can also mean frontier. It can also mean frontier. Frontier that is conducive to fresh starts in uncharted territory. Maybe we can approach Lent as an amazing adventure of spiritual formation, even in the midst of war and violence and strife and intolerance and divisiveness and prejudice, bigotry and prejudice. Spiritual formation that explores new ways of praying for peace. Anne Weems is no longer with us, unfortunately. She died about three or four years ago, but she spent her career as a poet. And some have called her the, um, the poet laureate of the Presbyterian Church USA. She has a poem I'd like to share with you about maybe exploring new ways of being, praying for peace. And interestingly enough, the, the, the title of the poem is I No Longer Pray for Peace. But listen what she does with this. On the edge of war, one foot already in, I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles. I pray that stone hearts will turn to tenderheartedness, and evil intentions will turn to mercifulness, and all the soldiers already deployed will be snatched out of harm's way, and the whole world will be astounded onto its knees. I pray that all the God talk will take bones and stand up and shed its cloth of faithlessness and walk again in its powerful truth. I pray that the whole world might sit down together and share its bread and its wine. Some say there is no hope, but then I've always applauded the holy fools who never seem to give up on the scandal of our faith, that we are loved by God, that we can truly love one another. I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles.
May the miraculous be so. Let us pray. Now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or imagine. To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Wow, what a word. Thank you, Reverend Fred, but most importantly, thank you for watching and being a part of this worship service. Again, if this word helped you, if it drew you closer to Christ, please call us, text, email, let us know how we can be a part of your life. If you haven't already subscribed, do so, please. But thank you so much for joining us here at CN Jenkins Memorial Presbyterian Church. This is Pastor Cannon. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.